from a defabricated solar-powered garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode... A look at how American fashion trends might follow Australia's lead and bring back the mullet. And now, the podcast host who might just ignore that particular fashion trend because he is bolder than Flipper the Dolphin, Pete Dominic. Yes, indeed, my choices for hairstyles are severely limited, although I suppose I could grow it all the way out and have just a kind of a reverse mullet. Is that right? And by the way, the mullet has made it here. I see teenagers wearing that all over the place. It's terrible. It's just a terrible look. I don't know why anybody would allow themselves to look that way or their child or a loved one to look that way, but it is back, and thank you very much, Pete Coe, who is also back, and welcome to today's episode of Stand Up. I've got Michael Cohen coming up, a great conversation with the Speech Boy, the former Boston Globe columnist and now independent writer at his own Substack. Always great to talk with Michael Cohen. We talked debt ceiling. We talked about how the Mueller probe is going down the memory hole, and so many people, including those many in Congress, are for getting what Mueller concluded. Also talked a little bit about Tim Scott, Ron DeSantis, and more. My conversation with Michael Cohen begins at about 30 minutes in, if you want to skip ahead. But first, the legend is back. I've got Bruce Bartlett joining me today to talk about the history of the debt ceiling and where he thinks we're headed, as well as his testimony in front of the Senate last week. I played that on the show last week, and Bartlett is coming up at 12 minutes where I called him yesterday in his home. But first, just a couple quick news stories. Of course, the big story is the debt ceiling and remains the debt ceiling. I get into that with both my guests today. Other news, Ron DeSantis is going to launch his presidential bid on Twitter, on Twitter Spaces, which is like an audio feed, along with Elon Musk. So just in case anybody was wondering who Elon Musk supports, I'm going to go ahead and have to say it's Ron DeSantis. Conservatives constantly projecting that big tech is biased to Democrats, but a lot of people pointed out that the old Twitter head, Jack Dorsey, never came on Twitter and told people to vote for Democrats. Mark Zuckerberg never launched Joe Biden's presidential campaign with him on Facebook, and yet... You got Ron DeSantis sitting down with Elon Musk. Birds of a racist, xenophobic, misogynistic, homophobic feather is what my friend Michael Mann tweeted. Chris Hayes tweets, two of the most charming, charismatic and relatable men you could possibly think of. And Jared Yates Sexton writes, do I find it surprising that Ron DeSantis, an authoritarian, every soulless tech and right wing ideologue salivates over for own purposes, is teaming up with Elon Musk, an oligarch actively radicalizing the population for his own empowerment? No, no, I do not. And finally, Peter Hose has reacted. Dr. Peter Hotez says, unbelievable. Ron DeSantis and his team have worked to falsely discredit both vaccines and scientists, even me personally. On Fox News, depressing to see how Twitter will amplify his voice. Equally depressing to see how Twitter seeks to silence me and my colleagues. So just uh, a little bit of reaction to the news that DeSantis is going to sit down with Elon Musk to announce his presidential campaign on Twitter tonight. A man who crashed a U-Haul truck into security barriers near the White House has been charged with threatening the president. Apparently he, well, I saw the video, he had a Nazi flag inside the truck. Of course, people are saying that that's a false flag, literally, and that somebody placed it there. But I don't know. Maybe U-Haul should ask a few questions before people rent their trucks. Like, hey, uh, are you a any chance you're a Nazi? And anyway, we'll see what happens to this guy. Another day, another American Nazi. Let's see. What else can I tell you? Oh, the HBO streaming service uh, turned into Max overnight, and then it was temporarily down on launch day. How about that? I mean, why the hell did HBO change their name to Max? What was wrong with HBO? I mean, was a lot of people making all kinds of jokes and criticisms of the stupid idea. I'd love to know why they came up with this. But uh, not only that, it was uh, down uh, during uh, launch day. So somebody's getting in trouble over there at Max. It's going to be hard to say. Is anybody really going to start saying that? Ford is deciding to keep AM radio on their 2024 models because, uh, I guess, a bipartisan group of federal lawmakers introduced a bill calling the National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Administration to require AM uh, in 
new vehicles at no additional cost because of the emergency alert system that broadcasts over that ban. I guess that's the reason. And finally, the Surgeon General is warning that there's not enough evidence to show that social media is safe for children and teens. And he's calling on tech companies, parents and caregivers to take immediate action to protect kids now. Here's a three minute segment from the Today Show about this with Hallie Jackson and the Surgeon General Vivek, Dr. Vivek Murthy, or as I call him, Brown Ezra Klein, or Ezra Klein could be white Vivek Murthy, whatever one you want. Just look at these two guys. They look exactly the same and I can't get over it. Anyway, here it is. For decades, there's been that Surgeon General's warning on packs of cigarettes. But this morning, for the first time, a new warning about something else, social media and what it means for kids' mental health. Why now for this advisory? We're issuing this advisory to sound the alarm. Surgeon General Vivek Morthy says there's not enough evidence to show social media platforms are safe enough for kids and teens. We see rates of depression and anxiety and suicide and loneliness going up among young people. And I'm concerned that social media is an important driver of that youth mental health crisis. Uh, This is the defining public health issue of our time, youth mental health. Research shows 95 percent of teens are on social media. More than a third say they're on constantly. And teens spend an average of three and a half hours each day on these kinds of apps. Something research shows can double the risk of experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety. The other day, my daughter uh, came up to my wife and I and asked us if she could post uh, a picture on social media. How old is she? My daughter is five years old. She's actually in preschool, um, but she's been hearing about this from her, her friends. All of the big platforms require users to be at least 13 years old to create accounts. But nearly 40 percent of kids ages 8 to 12 say they've used social media, too. Tech expert Max Stossel sees it in the conversations he's had in the past six years with more than 100,000 students, parents and teachers. When I started doing this work, I was getting the question, is 16 too young to give my kid a smartphone? Now I'm getting the question, is like third grade too young to give my kid a smartphone? Stossel recommends 14, but ultimately the right age may be different for different families. You are almost certain to get pushback from tech companies who say they're trying to protect kids. They have age limits in place. I appreciate that the technology companies have taken some steps uh, to try to, to keep kids safe, but it hasn't been nearly enough. The Surgeon General thinks Congress can and should do more to regulate social media companies. The same way safety standards are in place for car seats, for example. And at home, the advisory recommends creating a family media plan together, implementing tech free zones like at mealtimes and partnering with other parents with similar philosophies for support. What's at stake here is is our kids and their future, plain and simple. Here's the thing. The Surgeon General's advisory acknowledges there are good things about teens being on social media, the ability to connect, to have friendships, to find support. We've reached out to the big social media platforms on this, waiting to hear back, but many of them have put some safety precautions in place. Meta, for example, prompts teens to take breaks and has a family center and guides to help people use the platform. It really is a debate for each family. If you're wondering, OK, what is the Surgeon General doing? He tells me that he and his wife plan to wait until their kids are out of middle school to get on those apps. Well, good luck to Dr. Vivek Murthy and his wife as they tell their kids that they can't have a phone or at least be on social media until they're out of middle school. It's probably about the time everybody's getting on social media. And I think that's still too early. One thing to give them a phone and they just change overnight. But social media, man, that makes it so much worse. Parenting is hard, isn't it? I want to again thank everybody that listens to the show that has supported me over the years for and those of you who reached out after what happened to my daughter when she got bilked for five thousand dollars. I want to thank everybody for reaching out to me. People are still reaching out and it's really amazing that how many people care, how many people donated to that GoFundMe that Pete Co started. But I did want to read one email from a listener named Doug, who has been listening to the show for a really long time because I just thought it was great. And I thought it was good advice. And Doug's a great guy. He and his wife, Eliza, have been super supportive of me. And Doug wrote, I hope you guys and your daughter are feeling better after the trauma of her losing money. Eliza and I know full well the doubt you feel as parent when your kids are about to go into life and something like this makes you wonder if you've fully prepared them. My kids are 22, 25, and 28 now, and the last 10 years have taught me that they're never fully prepared, no matter how much you tried. Failures and successes happen regularly in their adult lives, with the former seeming to happen more frequently. 
It probably isn't really that way, but you can't help but thinking that when you still feel so much pain to watch them struggle. And I've constantly questioned myself about what more I could have done 10 or 20 years ago that would have made a difference now. But honestly, I think it's the moments that they fail, even though they're the most painful for parent and child, that are the best ways to teach us how to handle what's in front of us. It doesn't mean we'll know how to exactly handle everything, but it gives us that muscle memory that helps us endure the hard moments. It's like a callous soul. It can stay pure forever, but we still take it hard to see our kids take on that damage. We can't help but take it personally. Doug goes on to write more, but I just thought it was so, so thoughtful. And he finished up by saying, when they fall, we fall too. We hurt just as much as they do sometimes. And they see that and they know they're not alone and that they're loved. They get up, carry on, hopefully wiser, no worse for the wear. But we have to get back up and carry on as well. It gets harder each time, especially when they're adults. So I hope you and Val aren't beating yourselves up over this. You thought of everything you could to think of, and it still happened. Dust yourself off and keep going. Because raising your kids to 18 is metaphorically just like when you picked up little Ava the first time she fell. When it comes to parenting, you're only at the beginning, my friend. Doug, thank you for that. And I hope everybody else appreciates that. And I wanted to share it as much as I did. Really, really nice letter from Doug and very thoughtful about resilience in our kids and in ourselves. All right, well, that's what I've got for you here at the opening, and now it's time to get to my conversations. Like I said, Michael Cohen is coming up at, if you want to skip ahead to it. But right now, back by very popular demand, one of the all-time favorites on the old show. He's only been on the podcast a couple of times. He's tough to book. He's he's like, I don't have anything to say. But then I see him out there in front of the Senate and on MSNBC, and I say, I got to get this guy on. He's a historian, he's an author, he serves as a domestic policy advisor to Ronald Reagan as a treasury official under George H.W. Bush. He has seen it all. He's written uh, several books, including most recently, Truth, The Truth Matters, A Citizen's Guide to Separating Facts from Lies and Stopping Fake News in Its Tracks. He's on Twitter at Bruce Barlett, and I called him up because he, I think, I mean, I don't even know if I have his cell. I called his landline, he answered, and this is basically how it sounds. Hello? Bruce Bartlett, Pete Dominic. Hey. When can you talk? Now's good. Now works? And, uh, and I, I, I promise not to go to the bathroom this time. Oh, that's okay if you do. I can uh, just take, <laughs> just make sure you take the phone with you. <laughs> How are well, you? Well, that's what I did last time. I know. It's the greatest. I'm, I'm okay. You're okay? How's Nancy? Uh, just fine. Uh, she's getting ready to go out to California for a, a girl's, uh, you know, week alone away from their husband, you know. Oh, well, what's, uh, what's, what are you going to do while she's gone? Are you going to get into trouble, probably? I'll do the same things I did before I married her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> um, yeah, it was uh, pretty boring. All right. Well, I'll do like 15 minutes with you or so. Does that work? Now? Yeah. Can you? Oh, yeah, sure. Fine. All right. I'm going to hit record. All right. Well, people always ask me, where's Bruce Bartlett? And I said, I don't know. Last time I emailed him, he's like, I don't have anything to say. But then I saw him in Washington, D.C. in front of a Senate hearing and on MSNBC. And I was like, well, uh, give me give me some. Give me some Bartlett. And so I called him and here he is. Welcome back, sir. Happy to be here. How did it happen that you found yourself in front of that Senate hearing the other day? How, how did that happen? Well, the uh, the Senate Budget Committee staff called me a couple weeks ago, and one of the staffers remembered uh, some testimony I'd given, I don't know, maybe in 2017, I don't remember, uh, where I explained that the Bush and Trump tax cuts were utterly worthless economically. And they wanted me to come up and uh, basically repeat that testimony, uh, which I was happy to do. Uh, basically, to be honest, I cut and pasted uh, my previous testimony, so uh, uh, which is you can't find on the web anywhere. So I figured it was okay. I wasn't really, uh, you know, plagiarizing <laughs> myself. Well, you've got all those filing cabinets. It's filed away there somewhere, I would imagine. So yeah, that's true. Tell, tell me a little bit about that, how the the tax cuts, these tax cuts in general, or at least those types of tax cuts weren't beneficial economically. So we can get to this issue of of uh, that we're that we're finding ourselves in today with the debt ceiling. Well, well, first of all, the Republicans, you know, are um, think they're they're just implementing a strategy that was very successful economically for Ronald Reagan. And while I think it's true that the 1981 tax cut 
uh, was beneficial to the economy, the, the, the economic circumstances were, were quite different in those days. Uh, furthermore, uh, the, there were lots of other things going on in 1981, 82. You had a, a snapback from the recession. Yet the Fed was easing monetary policy very substantially. Uh, spending on, on the military, purchasing goods and services, is, uh, w- was rising very rapidly. That's just standard Keynesian economics. So you had lots of things uh, besides the um, tax cut that were helping the economy. And furthermore, uh, everybody except me seems to have forgotten that Reagan raised taxes 11 different times Hmm. during the 1980s after the 81 tax cut. And these tax cuts in the aggregate took back more than 50% of the tax cut. So you had a much smaller tax cut uh, on, you know, on net uh, than people think. And secondly, I went through the, the academic literature on the impact of the uh, Tax Reform Act of 1986, which had very little impact. Uh, the Bush tax cuts, I've been unable to find any positive impact in any study in an, a, a respectable academic journal. Hmm. And the same is true of the, the Trump tax cuts. There are several uh, studies that I link to in my prepared statement and none of them find any impact at all. We just gave away a lot of revenue. Uh, the, the national debt increased $8 trillion during the Trump administration, and the Republicans just rubber-stamped increase in, in the debt limit <clears throat> Excuse me, three times without demanding any budget cuts or any uh, changes in policy. So it it just seems to me that the hypocrisy here is just so overwhelming that I just can't take it. What was it like for you to have that uh, Foghorn Leghorn Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana question you about your your tweets? Uh, that was one of my favorite things I've seen in a very long time. I appreciate you sharing that with me. I recorded it and put it on that day's episode of the podcast, by the way. People loved it. Well, how How did that feel? Well, I, I, I wasn't altogether surprised that somebody brought up my Twitter uh, account. I, I do say a lot of um, snarky things, uh, but uh, Kennedy is just such an idiot. He apparently hadn't actually looked at what I said. He had some staffer print off a couple that I think he thought were embarrassing to me and that I would you know, try to walk back or explain away or deny that I had said these things. And I think he was taken aback when I said, yeah, Senator, I said that. I agree with that. And you really have to see it. You also have to watch for Senator Kane of Virginia. Yep. I who played that him. too. I played that too. It's almost as if you guys had talked about that ahead of time. Like he knew exactly what your tweets were in reference to. Oh, absolutely. I was very, very pleased because uh, I couldn't really take the time to do uh, say all the things that Senator Kane said. And so all I had to do for both of them was just sit there and say, yes, Senator, yes, yep. Senator, which is always a good strategy. It was a good strategy. I, I could never have done what you did. I was very impressed with your patience, uh, given who you are. I mean, I've, I've, I've heard you unleash on people, and it's one of my uh, more enjo- <clears throat> enjoyable moments in life. So, well, I thought that was great. Did, does, uh, did, do you think anybody was convinced? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh Senate hearings, House hearings, these are all just for show. Uh, They're not to to actually learn anything. Uh, I think once upon a time, a hearing served a useful purpose, but today they're just PR. So talk to me about your feelings on where we're at with this debt ceiling and what you've seen throughout your career with the debt ceiling and, and, and what, if any place it has in our country, in our budget. Well, the the debt ceiling is nuts. Uh, Somebody should have gotten rid of it a long, long time ago. FDR could have done it. LBJ could have done it. Maybe even Clinton. I don't know. But uh, it's exactly analogous to this situation. You spent money. 
you paid for it on with your credit card, and now the credit card bill has come in, and you suddenly decided, I'm not going to pay my bill because that's the fiscally responsible thing to do to prevent further indebtedness. And, and that's just nuts. Uh, we're, all the debt limit does is allow the Treasury to get the cash needed to pay the bills that Congress has already spent. And, and so it's just the height of hypocrisy to pretend that it's anything other than totally irresponsible not to raise the debt limit when, when it comes due. So it's come due, and here we are with just days left. What will happen? I, I feel like I saw one of your tweets that it really uh, scared me or upset me about the kind of the permanent damage that it would do. What are your what are your predictions as to what could happen if the debt ceiling isn't gotten rid of, lifted, etc.? Well, unfortunately, it's an unprecedented situation uh, where I think the administration errs in is one they don't understand just how nuts the House Republicans are. Number two, how weak a Speaker McCarthy is. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, I had a fourth one there someplace. But anyway, the, uh, the situation is, is far more dire than I think anybody believes. We're playing a game of chicken here, and I'm afraid it's going to end up like the end uh, of Rebel Without a Cause, where mm-hmm. somebody goes over the cliff just out of sheer stupidity rather than uh, through intent. Uh, but uh, there, there's no question that one thing that absolutely will happen is if there's any kind of default, even if it's for hours or, or days, uh, it'll have a permanent impact on, tre- on on interest rates. It will raise the interest rate the Treasury has to pay, not just temporarily, but forever. And the reason we know this is because back in 1979, the Treasury had to print checks to, to pay uh, interest on the debt, and the and the machines broke down uh, for for a, about a month or so, and they weren't able to print the, you know the checks literally, and so there was a default on Treasury bills. And ten years later, some economists studied the impact. And they found that interest rates the Treasury was paying were very substantially higher, uh, 60 basis points, if people know what that means. That's six six tenths of a percentage point. But on a really large uh, debt, as as we had then and have now, that's an enormous amount of money. That's billions and billions of dollars more that the Treasury will have to spend on interest now and forever. Right. Wow. That is some analysis that only Bruce Bartlett could reference, maybe. I haven't heard anybody else really be talking about that but you, so I appreciate that. Um, let- well, I don't know why the Treasury Secretary isn't being more aggressive in, in talking about these things. And the, the chairman of the Fed knows this stuff very well. Jay Powell, the chairman, is an old friend of mine. We work together at the Treasury Department during the Bush 41 administration. And Jay's job was to be in charge of the whole domestic finance office, which is in charge of selling the bonds that we need to get the cash to pay the nation's bills. So we have people here. And of course, uh, Secretary Yellen is a former chairman of the Federal Reserve herself. These people know what is happening. And for some reason, they're playing their cards very close to the vest. And I can only assume it's because that's what Biden wants them to do. And I don't know, I'm I'm baffled by all of this. Uh, What do you make of today's Republican Party of Kevin McCarthy, who's just barely clinging and got power and, and what he's doing here? Or, you know, we haven't talked in a while of, you know, how far they've gone, I guess, off the cliff. How do you look at today's Republican Party? How do you see it? Well, I see this crazy group in Congress called the Freedom Caucus Mm -hmm. in the House of Representatives. They're the tail wagging the whole Republican dog because they have enough votes that they can kick McCarthy out of his position anytime they feel like it. One of their demands when they took when the Republicans took over the House was that at any time 
any single member of the House can demand a vote on who the speaker is. And McCarthy, as we remember, needed several days and many, many votes to become speaker uh, back in January. And he knows that he needs every single Republican vote. I think uh, if five, if only five Republicans vote with the Democrats, you know, that that's a majority. So he's, he's, he's got a very thin margin and I think the, the, the caucus will kick him out unless he does exactly what they tell him. And, uh, it's hard to see how he, <clears throat> excuse me, he can get out of this. Yeah, I think you're probably right about that. What do you think about what uh, Trump has done to the party, and was it already on its way there? Well, he's clearly made everything about that was bad about the Republican Party before 2016 uh, vastly worse. I think it'll be an interesting topic for you know academic papers in the future to see who did more damage to our country and to the Republican Party. Donald Trump or Newt Gingrich. Hmm. They both did very, very terrible things. And uh, there, there's just absolutely no leadership in the Republican Party uh, towards any kind of sane, rational, conservative, Reaganite type policy. And unfortunately, there's very little leadership in the Democratic Party as well. Uh, they're very passive. They just act, stand there, you know, with their hands in their pockets like, Ah, there's nothing we can do except let the Republicans do what they want to do. And I think this is just terrible politically and substantively. I think we in, historians reward presidents like Lincoln and, and Roosevelt who, you know, seized the, the moment and were aggressive about uh, doing what had to be done under a uh, crisis situation uh, but Biden seems to think, ah, my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do. Bruce Bartlett, so great to catch up with you and get your thoughts on things. Uh, I don't know what else you have left for the day, but probably a nap. Didn't we? Did, aren't you the person who told me that when you take a nap, it's like you have two full days? Didn't you tell me that once? Yeah, that's right. I get a work day in the morning, and, and I get another work day after my 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 nap because. I'm one of these people that needs to be, you know, physically rested yep. to be able to write and uh, do substantive work. So, uh, yeah, I still uh, take a nap every day on the same couch I've been using for 30 years. <laughs> uh, and I think I've talked to, I think I've gotten Nancy into the habit as well. So, wait, you can you send me a picture, a photo of that couch I can include in today's episode? Okay. I definitely will. I, I would literally was about to ask you, do you take it in the same place around the same time every day? And I'm seriously fascinated by by this. And I've been quoting you for years about the the nap gives you two days. And I try to take a nap most days for the same exact reasons, as you say. But uh, are you are you clockwork? Are you very routine? It's obviously the same couch, but. Well, fairly, fairly. Yeah. Uh, mostly I just sit on my computer and make snarky comments on uh, uh, <laughs> Twitter. And, uh, you know, I figure, you know, Senator Kennedy will read them if nobody else. Did you hesitate were, did, to giving me credit for creating your Twitter account during that testimony? Well, I've never denied it. Uh, I mean, we, we you bring it up every time <laughs> I'm on your show. but <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you just blame me? You know, me? I had to stop using, you know, you set the account up on something called Hootsuite. Uh-huh. I had to stop using that because they started charging people money to oh. use it. Oh, that was me. That I was getting a cut. Damn it. <laughs> Didn't realize I that. See. Uh, thank you very much, my friend. Great to connect with you. And uh, I've satisfied uh, a lot of thirst for a lot of listeners who, who wanted you to come back. So I'm happy to, to have you back. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, there he goes, everybody. Bruce Bartlett on the phone. I hope you appreciated that. I always learn a lot from him. Love to hear from him. Great guy. And he did send me a photo of his couch, but I'm only allowing paid subscribers to see it. I'll include it in today's subscriber email. So if you never open that, open it today. You should be getting it sent to your email. If you're not, let me know. But it should be coming to you every day from Patreon and stand up with Pete Dominic. I'll throw a photo of that uh, leather black couch and it is legend 
All right, there you go, Bruce Bartlett. How about it? Now it's time to get to my second guest. He is the great Michael Cohen, the real Michael Cohen, the original Michael Cohen before his name was sullied by Trump's lawyer becoming infamous. He's on Twitter at SpeechBoy71, where he's always active and always great. You can read and subscribe. You should support him at truthandcons.substack.com, where he's writing about the Democratic roadmap for 2024. The Russia investigation was not a hoax. And, of course, the debt ceiling, the 14th or not to 14th. That is not the question, he writes. And we talked about all of that and more here on today's conversation. We started on the video chat app I use called StreamYard, and it wasn't working. So we went over to the phone. I don't think you really lose too much quality there. Uh, If you notice such things, let me know. I'd love to know who those sensitive listeners are. I always overthink and worry about that stuff. But we got the goods with Michael Cohen, and let's do it right now. Uh, We're off with the great Michael Cohen. Sir, thank you for joining me. I know you really have been on the Tim Scott train for a very long time, and you wanted to make the case as to why you think he's going to be the nominee, which I think is risky. Go ahead, though. Uh, Thanks for that intro, Pete. I actually think Tim Scott is a would be a tough candidate for Democrats because he's not really full MAGA like other Republicans are. But I think that he has no chance of winning the Republican nomination. I do think, however, that Republicans would love the chance to vote for a black man just so they can prove to themselves that they're not really racist. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm curious about that. Uh, I think he actually has a real chance because of it. But unfortunately, in this Trumpian political environment within the Republican Party, he has no chance at all. Let me ask you just quickly about that, because I think it's something that people don't understand very well. Racist people, bigoted people really don't understand very well. And I'm being thoughtful and, and, and generous when I say it, that you can have really close friends. You could marry a person of color, a Jewish person, etc., and still be a bigot, a racist, an anti-Semite. Sure. Uh, but people, you know, are pretty well convinced that, you know, I, I know and, and like and admire several black folks that are in my life and several others that I, that I don't even know. How can I be racist? Absolutely. Explain that. How do you explain that to people? What it means to be racist or hold prejudiced or bigoted attitudes. We throw the R word around a lot, but I think all of us in some ways are, are a little racist. I mean, sure. we live in a society defined by, we stereotype people, we stereotype, you know, ethnic groups, we stereotype, you know, uh, by gender, by race, by class, what have you. So I, I don't know if that's a terribly, I mean, I think maybe that's not a terribly controversial thing to say, but I do think that, you know, a lot of people who who vote for Republicans or vote for Donald Trump will convince themselves they're not really racist. Uh, they'll rationalize away their racism. And, and usually people are not openly racist. I mean, around the N-word and say dehumanizing things about people of color. It's a little more subtle than that. But I think in the case of Tim Scott, I just think that a lot of Republicans would, you know, are offended at being called racist. And if they could vote for Tim Scott as a Republican, it would let them allow them to say, look, I'm not really racist. I voted for Rogan. Look, some of my best friends are black. Right. Some of my presidential candidate choices are black. It's like a way of of excusing their otherwise racist views. Certainly how I excuse my anti-Semitism. Sure. Sure. I mean, you and I are friends. Right. We spend time together. But clearly, when you know, you obviously um, hate the Jewish people. Uh, so there is that Jewish person. I like Jewish persons. Well, the like Jewish thing, persons. Uh, speaking of anti-Semitism, last night uh, a man in a U-Haul truck crashed into the White House, and apparently he is a Nazi, or at least he had Nazi flags. Maybe I'm going too far to saying he's a Nazi. Um, don't you think that America needs uh, desperately needs a history lesson? That we've completely forgotten what happened in. in um, last century. And I think this generation has no idea. I mean, I actually think the younger generations have, you know, a pretty good sense of what is prejudice and what is racism. And they are pretty outraged by it. Uh, I think it's the older generations who may have some memory of, of, or have better understanding, at least of Nazis and World War II, who seem to be the ones who have the most discriminatory uh, views these days. So I don't know, you know, look, people believe what they want to believe. And you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, the other day, I wrote a piece on the Mueller report. This was sort of piggybacking off of the Durham. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Dustin that Berger. for sure. So, you know, and I just made the point that like Mueller's report, you know, not only showed 
collusion between the, the Trump campaign and, and Russia when it came to interfering 2016 election. But, you know, the 10 incidences Trump obstructing justice as president, which is a felony. And I got this overwhelming response to people being like, you're lying. You're lying, dude. That didn't really happen. It's not true. Mm. Mueller didn't find it. And like, you could just read the friggin' article and you can see that, in fact, no, that's actually what he found. But people are wedded to this worldview and you can't really seem to get them off of it. People don't want to hear facts. I mean, the amount of pe- number of people out there who I think are truly influential, influential, uh, able to be influenced is vanishingly small. Uh, yeah. And I think people just, you know, they, they choose a position based on their tribal affiliation, their partisan affiliation, and, and they just filter facts through that partisan viewpoint, you know, and look, it happens on both right and left. Um, it's more pervasive on the right for sure. But, you know, I think we all sort of do it in our own way. And it's very hard to, to find people who are actually open to being, having their minds changed. Yeah. I feel like I wanted to say there's a false equivalency, but I want to move on. No, I mean, but I, no, I look, I'll just let me say this. I, that there is a false equivalency in the sense that I think Republicans are much more inclined to do that. But like the idea that humans, you know, um, filter information through their 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 preconceived biases and prejudices is somehow affected just people who are Republican is kind of Fair silly. Enough. Well, I mean, certainly that. Yes, I agree fully with that more nuanced approach to it. And I do that all the time myself. So, yeah, sure. But often for me, it depends on who's telling me the information. That's that's my worst quality. Well, that's yeah. I mean, but I think, yes, I'm this sure person is true, usually wrong sure. about this issue and doesn't know or doesn't know anything about these kind of things. And so I don't really trust them on this or they're the kind of person that just says stuff. And then uh, turns out they're right and I'm wrong and I should have listened. Uh, look, I think it's I think there's a real market these days in, in the world of media to tell people what they want to hear. You know, Fox News has made a whole business model out of it, yeah. but I see it in the left also. I mean, there are people who just, you know, peddle sort of the uh, uh, an argument that people want to hear and they believe it and they yeah. they want more of it. That's um, why I actually so, subscribe to your work. I hate to compliment you like this, but I appreciate that about you. You I sometimes even say that I'm like, man, he's going to piss off a lot of his readers, subscribers. I don't know that he should do that, but that's your that's why I subscribe, because I don't mind hearing things that I don't agree with, especially when you're entirely embarrassingly wrong. <laughs> you know, I, I always think it's funny when people who read read me who agree with like 95 percent of what I say, if I say one they don't agree with. They're like they're so outraged by it. And I, I was like, you know, OK, we disagree. That's fine. We can offer you everything. Yeah. I mean, I don't agree with everybody, but everything. That's and, usually what you know, I call he, out my anti-Semitism. I'm a five percenter. When I don't agree with you, then I hit you as hard as I can with something. It, it's actually true of, of people with what they do. Uh, but let me get to that piece, because I think that's a really, really important piece, especially more so after having read it. And I haven't really talked about it here. And I think it kind of you know flew to some extent under the radar, certainly with with anti-Trumpers, Trump haters, progressives, Democrats, whatever. Uh, the Durham report that came out, your piece over at MSNBC, you also wrote something similar, Truth and Consequences. Apparently, you were going to write it there first, and then MSNBC said, can you write this uh, reaction to the yeah. Durham report? Uh, the title is, Trump wants us to forget Robert Mueller's findings, and it's working. The real bombshell of John Durham's report isn't that Trump was investigated over Russian collusion. It's that fo- so few seem to care about Mueller's findings. I really was happy to read this piece. I think it's a really important thing to be reminded of uh, because it can fade in your view. The Mueller investigation, the report, yeah. his testimony, which was weak because he was so bumbling. But still, your your piece does a great job. So what's the real bombshell of Durham's report? There is no bombshell. Right. I mean, it's a nothing burger, right? I mean, you know, uh, Republicans are making a big deal about the fact that that Durham apparently claimed that there was no reason to open the investigation, which is a, an argument he contradicted in the in the in the back end of the report. He said there was grounds for opening investigation. He said there was grounds for opening a preliminary investigation, not a full investigation, which is like, a, I mean, really, give me a break. It's a semantic difference that it's, it's irrelevant. And, you know, Durham has clearly been on. He's a partisan. He's clearly been trying to he was appointed in the sense to vindicate Trump, to disparage the Mueller report. 
I don't take a lot of what he said very seriously. A lot of what's in the in the conclusion of his report is stuff they took from the inspector general, stuff we already knew that the inspector general for the DOJ revealed three years ago or four years ago. So there's nothing really new there. But again, like there's not even if you buy this argument, they shouldn't they should not have investigated Trump over Russia. And I don't really see considering all the evidence that was evident that we knew at the time that we now know the FBI knew at the time. I don't I can't see any rationale for how you could justify saying we shouldn't have investigated the FBI should have investigated Trump. Clearly, I, I should feel have. like and cl- correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that the FBI was and is always investigating Russia, eyes and ears on Russia. And they saw what Russia was trying to do. And they backed into Trump with Papadopoulos and other yes. sources. They were looking yes. at Russia and you can't see Russia without seeing Trump. That's my recollection. Do I have that? There's just there was substantial evidence that, the, that there was some sort of connection between the Trump campaign and Russian officials who were interfering in the 2016 election. I mean, that is evident now. We know about the meetings between Russian officials and and members of the Trump family and the Trump campaign. We know that Paul Manafort turned over polling data to a Russian intelligence official. We know all of that. And Trump's you know, campaign the, chief turned over polling data to a Russian with connections to Russian intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, that happened. Um, and, you know, we have pretty good evidence that Trump knew in advance with the WikiLeaks uh, dump of Hillary Clinton's emails and that he and his campaign prepared a messaging strategy around it. You know, I mean, and we know that publicly he called for the Russians to 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 um, hack right. Clinton's emails, a hundred thirty thousand missing emails. But look, my, but my thing is like that isn't even the, the biggest issue here. Bigger issue in the Mueller report is he identified ten separate examples of Trump obstructing justice as president. Right? I mean, telling people on his staff to lie telling his chief counsel to falsify information, seeking to fire uh, Mueller repeatedly, dangling pardons to to uh, people involved in the investigation. I mean, there are the evidence is pretty overwhelming. And we all forget this now, but before the Ukraine in, uh, impeachment process began, more than half of House Democrats called on Trump to be uh, impeached or impeachment investigation to begin in the House based on the Mueller report. And, of course, once the Ukraine investigation happened, that was all forgotten. And there's been no follow up by DOJ mm-hmm. on the conclusions of the Mueller report. But, you know, it, this is a major friggin scandal. Sorry, but it is like the president of the United States obstructing justice repeatedly from the Oval Office. That's why Dick Dixon had to resign uh, the, the presidency because he obstructed justice on the Watergate investigation. Trump did it 10 times, <laughs> allegedly. So important. I mean, I. And I just it's very frustrating that we just that's all just flushed down the memory hole, yes. you know, and, be, and in part because the, the Trump people have just and the Republicans have pushed this lie now for four years. I know more than that for, yeah, four or five years saying there was a hoax, Mueller exonerated him, which he didn't do, you know, and, and said so in his in his testimony into Congress. Um, and the media, I think, has kind of dropped the issue. They, they, they let yeah. Trump say these things, let Republicans say these things, and, and don't even question anymore. But the reality is that Mueller came up with a lot of evidence, substantial evidence, that Donald Trump broke the law as president. That's a major scandal and a major story, and we should talk about it, and not this ridiculous, you know, Fakakta uh, yeah. uh, Durham report. Uh, reporters uh, should have uh, their own talking point prepared very quickly. Like uh, Robert Mueller found 10 instances of obstruction. Uh, Richard yeah. Nixon uh, quit over one. Uh, let me ask you, well, that's a really important piece. And let's not forget, let's not put that in the memory hole and go read that at Truth and Consequences or MSNBC dot com. But uh, let me quickly ask you about another piece you just published at your Substack: the Democratic roadmap for 2024. A look back at the 2022 midterm shows how Democrats overperformed and can do so again next year. So you took a look at this, uh, the data from a data firm called Catalyst that you say yeah. published a, a report that you found fascinating because you're a nerd. Uh, and I am a nerd. you summarized it in your yeah. stack. Democrats overperformed. Young people are the future. Women are smarter. And uh, what else? Paying a price for extremism is one reaction. And then one last thing. That's how you break it up with with data. But uh, how 
T- tell me how Democrats overperform. What does that even mean? So, you know, in midterm elections, usually uh, the first midterm after a new president is of a, of a party is inaugurated. Right. Is usually not a good political right. out, does not bring a good political outcome for the party in power. Democrats traditionally Democrat are the party in power. Democrats or Republicans lose. I think it's twenty six or twenty something in the mid to high twenties numbers. They traditionally lose. Um, twenty eighteen, Donald Trump Republican Party lost forty seats uh, in the House. Uh, Democrats, I think, lost what was it ten, eleven, maybe. Um, I can't remember exactly. It's it's a pretty low number. Most is frankly from redistricting. <laughs> they picked up seats in the Senate. They won a bunch of uh, tough gubernatorial races. They picked up a bunch of House uh, legislative chambers around in, in the states. So they did pretty well. And you know, catalysts trying to figure out why. I mean, I shouldn't say they did. They did. They, did, they overperformed considering to historically how they should have done. Right. And Catalyst looked at why, and I think there's you know a couple of really interesting conclusions that that I think give us a roadmap for 2024. One is that women voters continue to migrate to Democratic Party in, in huge numbers. Women vote more than men. They're voting across the board, across demo- what I thought I mean, across demographic groups. In fact, one of the biggest gains Democrats made was among non-college educated women. And you know, as you may know, uh, Democrats do not do well among non-college educated voters, but they actually picked up. Uh, uh, you know, I think five points or so among non college educated women, which is a kind of a huge deal. And a lot of that's because of abortion. And what's interesting is they did best in seats that were competitive. So places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Arizona and Georgia, they had close races. That's where Democrats did particularly well. And those were places where abortion was, you know, in some of those states, not all of them, was, was, was prominently, that was a prominent issue. So that's one thing. The second thing is young people. Uh, what's interesting about the young people is that the voting is that you're seeing generationally both millennials and generation Z are voting over only for Democrats. They're not voting in larger numbers. It's that those it's and, and it's that those 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 voters are voting predominantly Democratic, but also they're making up a larger share of the electorate. That's a huge thing, too. So it used to be obviously boomers were the majority electorate and and obviously was a huge percentage of the electorate that is decreasing as those, as those people are you know dying and they're being replaced by voters who are younger and are voting overwhelmingly Democratic. Uh, you know, as, as a long-term issue, this is a disaster for the Republican Party. And I don't know how they survive that. I, I really don't. I mean, they survive it by basically winning in red states. But as far as winning presidential elections, it's really hard to do if you can't win over young, younger voters. And we're not talking about like 1829. We're talking about people into their 30s as well. So the trends, so, the trends would seem to continue in terms of the demographic makeups of states, the way that they are gerrymandered into being a red state or even a blue state. But at the national level, you th- th- we're seeing something massively different. Am I understanding that right? Is that need a little bit more? No, I mean, I think that, you know, it's just that in, in the, on the national level, it's very hard to win a presidential election if your percentage of the electorate that you do, that you do best with is decreasing. Right. And that's what's happening. Right. You know, in red states, Republicans have such huge advantages with voters that it's very hard, even with the, the generational shifts, to win a lot of these a lot of these races. And I think, you, you know, it's interesting, too, like you saw this in, I think it was in Kentucky. They had a, a abortion issue on the, va- the ballot that, that, that the pro-choice side won. Um, it didn't necessarily translate 2022 midterms as far as what happened to Democrats statewide. K- Kansas is another state, too, where... The abortion referendum there won by a huge percentage. Democratic governor was reelected. Democratic senator, the Republican senator was, I think, won that year, too. In other words, Kansas is not going to have a blue state just because them, people are upset about the abortion issue. They're going to vote on that issue for, for the Democratic side. But in elections, they're probably going to vote more for Republicans. Right. So it's not the change is not as huge as Democrats might want it to be. But I think the bigger issue is that in swing states and uh, in places where that are competitive, that advantage with younger voters is really, really important. And and also with women voters, both those things play a huge role. And I think really limits the ability of Republicans to win, you know, uh, win a presidential election. And look, they've lost the, the, the they've lost the, the, the popular vote in eight of the last nine presidential elections. Is that right? Uh, I think that's right. Eight of the last or seven of the last eight or eight of the last nine. I can't remember. That's like an unprecedented 
streak in American yeah. history. There's nothing similar. Even when even when Roosevelt was winning, he didn't. There was never that many elections where Democrats, where one party was winning the popular vote. Now, of course, two of those Democrats lost 2016 and 2000. They lost. They won the popular vote, and lost the election. But the point is, on a on a popular level, since '92, Democrats have dominated right. on the presidential level, and I think the trend lines, you know, would suggest that's going to continue to happen. Uh, one last thing you wrote in this data is that for all the talk about Democrats losing support among Latino voters, there was no significant drop in Latino support for the party from 2020 to 2022, which I found I, I, I thought that was not the case. That was fascinating. Yeah, I thought that should have gotten more attention from the report. I mean, you've heard this line for a while now. That Democrats were losing support among Latino voters. And you saw that in 2020. You definitely saw it a place like Florida, Texas and elsewhere. Uh, it didn't happen this cycle. And I do. So there's two things going on here. One is that Cuban voters in Florida, for example, vote Republican. And that's one of the reasons why it totally do so well in Florida. But a place like Arizona, uh, Mark Kelly, senator there, did better than Trump, than Biden did with, with Hispanic voters. Mm. So Mexican-American voters tend to be more loyal to Democrats. I mean, Democrats are still winning six out of 10 Hispanic voters, which is pretty impressive. My question is whether or not that's a Trump phenomenon. In other words, are Hispanics voting for Trump because they because they like him? Maybe. But if that's true, you know, it should worry Republicans that they're not able to maintain their support for Trump like candidates in midterm elections because right. this that wasn't they weren't able to improve their, their their margins with Hispanic voters in this cycle, which I think is, you know, it's a bad sign for them. Um, I just think the bottom line is that trend lines for 2022 are all sort of positive for Democrats. You know, there, there's not a lot in the data that should give Republicans hope is what I'm saying. You know, they, and frankly, the decision to likely nominate Trump again and to double down on anti LGBTQ and, and, um, and racist and misogynistic policies as they've done over the past several months since 2022, you know, they've learned nothing from what happened and they're just going to, and they're making their situation politically worse. Basically. Okay, real quick. Will Donald Trump be the nominee even if he goes to jail? And when will he go to jail as Ty Cobb and and uh, uh, his former attorney general, Bill Burnham, Bo Burnham, Bill Barnett, Rob Barnett, uh, Bill Barr? I couldn't think of his name. I don't think he goes to jail before the 2022, 2024 election. Uh, hmm. I think he's charged. Is he convicted before then? I kind of doubt it, but maybe. Uh, I don't think it would affect his ability to be the nominee. Uh, it's, it's crazy to say this, but I just think that even if he's indicted multiple times between now and and the primaries in next year, I still think he's the nominee of the Republican Party. OK, so let me ask you about the debt ceiling, because <laughs> you wrote a great piece uh, aggregating a lot of different you, you've read. Clearly, a lot of different uh, expert point of view and analysis of this. Obviously, your political analysis is in here. And first of all, just real quick, crazy that this is happening. It's so frustrating yes. and maddening when we have so many real issues to solve <clears throat> and they make up something that will destroy not only the domestic economy, but the world economy. And not only temporarily, but in terms of interest payments, apparently interest rates, it could like permanently for a very long time. Yes. I mean, it's crazy that they're doing this and they're doing this after they allowed it to go the other way three times when they were in charge. And the, the political calculation here is probably accurate that if the economy gets destroyed, Democrats will be blamed for it, even though it's entirely the fault of Republicans. So top line on the strategy, and then we can dig into the the uh, potential scenarios here. I mean, you're right. No disagreement. I mean, what Republicans are doing is basically economic hostage taking. There's no other way, no other way to put it. And, but you know, I, here's the one I will say this negotiation, which is supposedly not about the debt limit, but it's about the debt limit is also about the budget. And if the white house can resolve the budget issue and avoid a government shutdown, and the debt limit and avoid an economic catastrophe, that's a huge win for them. It's a huge win for them. Because I think from their perspective, they want this issue to go away. 
they don't want to get in. I mean, there's some political benefit in this in the sense of it plays out the extremism of Republicans. Okay. I get that. I think it's largely forgotten a year and a half from now. And there'll be plenty more examples in the next 18 months of Republican extremism that they can run against. Yeah. But this isn't really one that they want to focus on. I think that a default, obviously, I think would hurt both parties, but probably would hurt Democrats more, although it's really hard to say. The government shutdown probably hurts Republicans more, but it's not, just not good in general. And I think from Biden's perspective, resolving this issue uh, and being the deal maker that he ran on, a guy who could work Republicans is probably more positive for him than even the even if the policy implications of whatever deal he agrees to are negative for the issues he cares about. I, I just think that's the that's the, the consideration here. Um, and why I think he wants to make a deal. Now, my issue is I don't know that that is a deal that's possible with this Republican caucus. I just right, don't right. know that it's possible um, because and I'll, and I'll explain the dynamic is pretty simple. Republicans are making a lot of extreme demands. They're not going to get those extreme demands. They're going to win some battles and lose most of them. So knowing the Republican Party, what I call the jihadist wing of the Republican Party, they're not going to be happy about getting less than everything. And many of them will vote against whatever deal Kevin McCarthy uh, reaches. And then the question becomes, do they then challenge him uh, uh, as his speakership and try to try to basically depose him as speaker. And I think for McCarthy, that's his number one concern, much more than default. Right. So I don't <laughs> know that there's a deal that McCarthy can agree to that if it gets, I don't know, to have or two thirds Republicans voting for it and Democrats, you know, push it over the line. Can that save his job? I don't know. And I think. That's why I'm not so sure a deal can get made. Right. And if the deal um, doesn't get made, and I agree with you, and a lot of people do, then the only thing left is for Joe Biden to use the 14th Amendment option, which yes. uh, the issues around that are what will the Supreme Court decide and how quickly, I, I, that's what I can't understand, would they be taking that up and, and making that decision, especially in a very busy month of June where these decisions uh, come down? I guess not busy for them. They've already made the decisions, but. So no deal. Is going to get made if no deal gets made, right? The, and the option is default or Fourteenth Amendment. Then I don't, I don't even understand the conversation here. Of course, Biden's going to going to go Fourteenth Amendment. I mean, if he doesn't, then it's idiotic, right? It's either it's either you know you accept default, you know that's going to happen, or you say I'll take the risk with the Supreme Court. And it's a risk, frankly, that you have to take if the option other option is like economic disaster which could boomerang against him. You know, I thought it was funny last week where Trump came out and called Republicans to default. Of course he wants to default. It's going to cause an economic a disaster, which will help him in 2024. He's looking out for himself. You know, and I'm sure for some Republicans, I'm sure that for quite a few House Republicans, they don't give a shit about default. They're in safe seats. They think it'll hurt Biden and help Trump and help any Republican get elected in 2024. I'm sure there's plenty of them who would like to see a default. So, you know, from that perspective, like, if Biden is faced with that option or invoke the 14th Amendment with all of its downsides, right, it could affect the markets. It may not, the, the court may not uphold it. You have to take the risk. You have to. And the second part is like, I don't, I don't think the court, I really don't think the court would overturn this. I don't. Because if it happens, like the court won't see the case until after the point when the, when the, when the Treasury Department has run out of money. Right. So, if they do this, then they'll be blamed. They it, right. The Supreme Court. They'll be blamed. If the, so so the Biden uses the 14th Amendment. The debt ceiling is no longer a threat. The Supreme Court then takes it up a couple weeks earlier, uh, later. Then whatever decision they come out with, if they overturn it, they say it's unconstitutional for Biden to have used the 14th Amendment. The economy, the world economy would be in free fall and John Roberts would be blamed. Yeah. And by the way, not just John Roberts, although that'd be much not. I mean, I'm sure, first of all, John Roberts, I think, would be in the would be on the side of let's not do this. Uh, yeah, but he <laughs> he's, he's, he gets blamed. Run. Yeah, but all, yes, ultimately, he's the chief justice to get blamed. But it wouldn't just be him. Who the hell brings the case? The House Republicans probably bring the case. They get blamed also. I, I just really don't see how the Supreme Court is going to 
make that call. And, and I think the more the Lakers scenario, they basically punt on it and say they don't have jurisdiction or they don't have standing or they'll come with some bullshit reason. I just don't think they're going to go that route because it would be for them politically and uh, public, uh, from a PR perspective, a disaster. And when it comes right after all this shit with Clarence Thomas and basically uh, Harlan yeah. Pro, do they really want to stick their finger again in, in the eye of the American public? Now, maybe they do. I'm sure Clarence Thomas doesn't give a shit. Well, I mean, but I think for the, all you know, they, Kavanaugh and Barrett, they might. I just don't get how, where all the, the, the Republican donors are, where the financial industry is, where even the Supreme Court justices who have their own uh, investment portfolios that would suffer. Everybody loses financially. Everybody loses. So whatever you're advocating for, whatever fiscal policy or tax policy you're advocating for as a conservative, that you got these Republicans in your pocket, doesn't matter. Nothing's worse than this, it would seem, that affects everybody. So I'm I'm shocked that there's not been more pressure put upon, or maybe the point is that it, it doesn't matter how much pressure they put. That's how ideologically driven House Republicans are because they were raised by right wing talk radio, not yeah. economists. And so that's my uh, I just answer. I talked to I talked to folks on Wall Street about this. And the, and the response I get is that they don't. Did you I speak to say that people on Wall Street just don't think this is going to yes, happen? Yes, that's my that's what I've heard, it. too. That's what I've heard from my finance friends. And so which I get. And I, it's interesting because. Um, I. It, the thing about that is, if it's, if it, I think they're mis, they're misjudging the situation, but I think also it does speak something that they don't understand the Republican Party, yeah. and they don't have the same connection to the Republican Party today. And I think also they um, they're not good also, political they, analysts sometimes, in that they can't understand. No, they're not they good political analysts. Understand, they're not good political analysts. As I'm saying, why would Republicans do this? There's no upside for them. So that's the beginning. I think their assumption probably is that Biden will act unilaterally. Uh, I think maybe, that's the maybe. assumption. Well, they'll probably be right then, because you also say in this piece that that, that Biden w- isn't going to let on that he's considering or, you know, would do the 14th Amendment because then the negotiation is over, which I think is a really good point. Right. Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, I, I, I got a good counter to that, which is that, you know, somebody made the point to me after I wrote that that said, look, well, but Republicans, they, they some of them want default. So that isn't going to change their thinking. Right. They're like, oh, OK, you're you know, they're they're their bigger biggest consideration is we want to hurt Biden. And so in their perspective, 14th Amendment is probably good for them because they don't get to vote on this thing. And then they can basically throw a temper tantrum and say that Trump, that, that, that Biden is uh, acting like a dictator and then they can impeach him, which, by the way, oddly would be good for, for Biden politically. I have a feeling I know it sounds weird to say, but I think it would help him point out the GOP extremism. I just think the incentive structure in this thing is really weird in that, you know, Democrats don't want default. Republicans, I think, kind of do want default, or they don't care if there's default. Right. I mean, they don't pay. I think their their calculation is they're not going to pay a price if there's right. default. Yep. I think that's their calculation. Yeah. I think they. I think that that is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous viewpoint, and one that could certainly go wrong. But I think that is their perspective. I think they think because look, and a lot of them are in safe seats. A lot of them are, I mean, most House Republicans are in very, very safe seats. And, you know, they're not, they're, the vault's not going to hurt them. They're not going to lose their, I wonder, lose their seats. I wonder, now, they might lose their majority in the House. I wonder, they don't really care. I wonder about that and those that aren't necessarily in safe seats, like I would argue my congressman, Republican Mike Lawler, is like, I, I, I'm wondering, you know. Mike Lawler is like circling the drain as far as his, his congressional career. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how he survives. And if there's a default, uh, he definitely will not. Oh, yeah. Survive. Yeah. Right. I hope you're right about that. All right. But he's already on. on thin Why ice. do you say that about Lawler? I'm, now I'm interested because he's my guy. Because he, he, his win was a fluke. You know, he's in a he's in a blue state. Well, he ran on the, uh, the, the, the I, crime I, scare, the crime scare. And now yeah, he, the crime issue was big in New York. He just did a great problem, job. He just did a great thing in rejecting all these poor migrants. He's like, no way. That's going to help him. Oh, that ridiculous story about the, the hotel. Yeah, 300, the, oh, yeah, they were 300. Was, they were all paid for. And, yeah. and Mike Lawler and all the other Republicans in my area are heroes for dehumanizing and rejecting these people from the uh, local. Look, here's the issue with, with the New York thing. You've got Democrats lost badly in New York. They, they, it cost them the House losing in New York. They're going to put a lot of money and resources and time into trying to win back these seats. You're going to have 2024 is going to be a much more democratic vote because you're going to have because you have a presidential uh, 
election. So Biden's on the ballot. That means it'll bring out more Democrats to vote. I think all of these Republicans in New York are vulnerable and they're all in districts that went for Biden or were, I think they all went ones. I think they're all the ones that went for Biden or at least are close, like maybe a Republican plus one or plus two. So I just think they're all going to be kind of um, uh, vulnerable. And the stuff the Republicans are doing in the House makes them more vulnerable. Uh, and if there's a default, it makes them even, even more vulnerable. So I just think, you know, if Mike Lawler survives, I'll be very, very impressed. But I would be surprised. I hope you're right. OK, Michael Cohen, I'll let you uh, continue on with your day. But I'm very happy that you spent a little bit of it with me. Love talking to you. Always a pleasure. Very much Pete. appreciated. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you again. All right, Michael Cohen, Speech Boy 71, truthandcons.substack.com. Go subscribe right now. I love reading this stuff. I really do. I'm happy to be a paid subscriber to that Substack. And you should be too, just as a way to thank him for joining us here, if you don't mind. And if you're not a paid subscriber here at Stand Up, what are you waiting for? Go sign up right now. I haven't had a subscriber in like two weeks, so I'm a little depressed and worried about that. Hopefully nobody's canceled because, uh, you know, the churn rate, not great for anybody that is running a subscription service from the New York Times all the way down little old me. So love to have some subscribers sign it up now. Always a great thing to see. Headed into Memorial Day weekend and the end of the month. Sign up now at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or standupwithpete.com. Thank you to Bruce Bartlett. Thank you to Michael Cohen. Thank you, of course, to Pete Coe and John Carroll for singing us out as he does in and out each and every day. Go buy his stuff at johncarroll.org right now and check out the show notes for more links. Write a review to the podcast. If you haven't done that, do that for me, if you don't mind, over on Apple and Spotify, wherever you listen. And subscribe to the YouTube channel because I'm going to get that going. That's my next project. Start doing some live YouTube stuff and posting more of my interviews up there. YouTube.com slash Stand Up With Pete. Please go subscribe to that. It's free. Just go hit subscribe. YouTube.com slash Stand Up With Pete now. All right. Here is Henry David Thoreau with today's quote of the day. What you get by achieving your goals is not as important as what you become by achieving your goals. All right. That's all right. But how about this one? One more. Maya Angelou. I like this one. My mission in life is not to merely survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor and some style. Ooh, I like that one. Thank you, Maya Angelou. Thank you, Henry David Thoreau, who are two people that are very different. But two quotes to end the show. And thank you to you. Love you. Bye bye. They knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand